110th day of class and the Mexican Revolution. And even though Mexico is our neighbor to the south, I'm always surprised how little my students know about Mexico compared to other places in the world. And we're going to get into the Mexican Revolution, which happened in 1910, but there were a lot of historical factors that led up to this revolution. But I also wanted to look at the art, and I want to make a point that art can tell a story as powerfully as the spoken word, or a lecture, or a reading, and I think uh, pictures can reach people in a way that some other forms of getting information across to people doesn't. So we started off by looking at some art. And the first part seemed very peaceful. People are working their everyday lives, and it's beautiful with the flowers, and people are working, and the beautiful countryside, and everyday family life. Things seem to be fairly peaceful, just everyday life. And this painting shows the, the tumult, the change, the, the revolution, the doo-doo hitting the fan, if you will. And then it tells another story through the art and the way the European powers were perceived with the luxury and the top hats and that kind of culture. And then you can see the uh, look on the people's faces that something isn't right. There's something concerning them. It's a different vibe. And then we see revolution in the air, and you can see this picture here, the, the knife in the back, the stabbing in the back of the revolutionaries, and you can see, you know, death looming, and you, you know, these, all of these portions of the painting have great symbolism, and you can read into those. And then we see the revolutionaries, the heroes, the iconography of the revolution and them fighting the revolution with the fire and the horses and all that goes into that kind of thing. There's a close-up of that picture. And then you can see the hardship that comes from revolution and the suffering that often stems from revolution. And you can just see the anguish. I just think it's a very powerful painting here that tells the story. Then obviously death. On the, on the black horse with death, the symbolism. But from this dark time, there's a regrowth. And take revolution at its core. It's getting rid of the old way and replacing it with something new, this rebirth at the end of it all. And then we can see the uh, revolution in one painting, Tierra e Libertad, land and liberty, at the core of this. So um, hopefully you had a chance to look at this art and evaluate it, and even though I didn't give you any details here, I hope you buy into my point that art can tell a story as effectively or in a different way than the traditional history. But here's the traditional history, because you're not going to be tested on paintings, are you? You're going to be tested on the history. So here's the more traditional story of the Mexican Revolution. And our starting point, even though the revolution occurred in 1910, we're going to go about 90 years before. And we start with Mexico being in political and economic chaos after independence. And the Spanish racial structure, class structure, remained throughout the Americas with the exception of Brazil. And in any of the colonies of Spain, your racial designation puts you in the place of society, a Creole or a Mestizo or an Indian or an African. And it, um, Iturbide was ousted in 1824. Mexico becomes a republic, and Santa Ana is the most dominant political leader. So that's our starting point. We're starting at a very chaotic point. And then the Mexican-American War. So if you ask yourself, how did America become America? Now, we started off with 13 colonies, 1776, and so forth. The Manifest Destiny and, and people moving to the West. But then this portion of the country, the Southwest, was formerly Mexican. And um, America seized this land that used to be Mexico. And in 1836, Americans proclaim independence of Texas. Uh, the French attempt to take Mexico in 1838. America fights the Mexicans from 1846 to 1848. Mexico is defeated. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 gave America California, Texas, Arizona, New Mexico. The U.S. paid Mexico $15 million, and property owners assured they could keep their property. So this is not the revolution yet, but it's a contributing factor which eventually led to revolution.
Now, continuing on, Benito Juarez is elected president in 1858, and he confiscated church property, and Mexico suspends payment of foreign debt in 1861. So again, when you are changing the very power structure of a group of people, uh, you run a risk, but he was trying to get some order, trying to get some um, autonomy and self-reliance and power back in Mexican hands, considering what had happened beforehand. And then another foreign invader, the French occupy Mexico. And the French occupy Mexico in 1861, capture Mexico City in 1863. Uh, Louis Napoleon makes Archduke Maximilian the emperor. So again, the Mexicans have been dealing with these foreign powers for some time, and it was not a good fit. Uh, Maximilian and the Austrians never understood Mexico, and there was a lot of revolts. People didn't want to put up to, you know, with it. Uh, they eventually got rid of him, and Juarez is restored into power. And then we go with Diaz. Now, Diaz wanted order and progress. He wanted to stabilize, industrialize, develop industry with foreign capital, more of a modern sort of thinker, uh, definitely more of a 20th century thinker and investing in infrastructure like railroads, doing business with other countries, um, starting an oil industry, trying to be on par with the other industrial powers of the world that were blossoming during this time. And the uh, Porfiriato, sorry, I mispronounced that badly. Let me try that again. Porfiriato, better. It's probably going to come across as Italian, not as Spanish. But foreign and Mexican owners discriminated against Mexican workers and Mexican middle class, did nothing for the poorest people. They neglected education and they confiscated ejidos, uh, the common land. So we have this group of people in this push to industrialize and modernize. People at the bottom are left out, and that's going to be a problem. Okay, you cannot mistreat people without them rising up and having some sort of dissension over that. And this begins the Mexican Revolution. Again, from this dissension, by 1910, large portions of the Mexican society are fed up with Diaz and his initiatives. Political and social turmoil resulted. People are worked up over it, and rightly so. They were mistreated. And again, you cannot mistreat people forever without them rising up. And in 1911, Diaz is overthrown. And then they put Madero in, and he becomes the new president. Revolution. Out with the old in with the new. And this becomes the trinity of the uh, Mexican Revolution. Now, learning about Italy the other day, it was Mazzini, and it was Cavour, and it was Garibaldi. To the Mexicans, it was Madero, Zapata, and Villa. And they kept this revolutionary fervor going. And Zapata organized these peasants from southern Mexico who were neglected under the Diaz administration. Uh, Pancho Villa organized peasants from northern Mexico. They started to incorporate new technology like machine guns. They understood media and marketing and iconography. Um, more of a modern way of thinking. Again, the Mexican Revolution is late. Understanding the Age of Revolution began in 1750. This is later in the story. And then we have Huerta and the U.S. Um, and uh, Victoriano Huerta leads Mexico in uh, 1930, 13 and overthrows Madero. And then the U.S. intervenes for Standard Oil because of the money. And the Navy shows up in Veracruz. And I understand the Mexican history with America is not very positive at this point. From uh, the Mexican-American War, where America seized huge portions of land that used to be Mexico. And the U.S. backs Carranza, and Carranza becomes president. So um, Huerta is out of power and the U.S. leaves, but the chaos continues. So to the Mexican people, when the U.S. got involved, it was not positive in their history. And as a, a form of rebellion, Pancho Villa invades the United States, and he becomes a hero out of principle for this. And the U.S. did everything they could to try to catch Pancho Villa. They put uh, John Pershing and the U.S. Army to Mexico, and they couldn't get him. The U.S. fails. So when the Zimmerman note came out, if you recall that, that letter the Germans sent to Mexico trying to get Mexico to undermine America, 
which was one of the main reasons the U.S. got into World War I, you have to understand from the Mexican history why they'd have a reason to try to undermine the U.S., because the U.S. had not have a, had a positive relationship with them. But then eventually this constitutionalism I spoke of earlier happens in Mexico like lots of places. And the Mexican Constitution was ratified in 1917. Universal suffrage, meaning you can everybody can vote, restrictions on fo foreign ownership to try to get more money and power in Mexican hands, eight-hour workday, a minimum wage, agrarian reforms, meaning farmers, um, you know, have a better situation than they did before, which makes Mexico a modern nation starting at that point, and Zapata and Villa and the end of the revolution. So you can mark the end of the revolution when Zapata is tricked and executed in 1917, and that, you can say, ended the revolution in South Mexico, and Carranza cuts a deal with Pancho Villa, and then Villa is assassinated in 1923, uh, still remains a hero for his revolutionary fervor and energy. And that's the story of the Mexican Revolution. So thank you for watching.